Welcome, everyone. I'm Alison Larkin Powell. I'm co chair with Alex Zucker of Pan America's Translation Committee. I'd like to thank you all for coming out this evening and to thank the Center for Fiction for hosting us. The Bridge series is the only reading series in New York dedicated to literary translation, and the Pan America Translation Committee is pleased to co present the Bridge, in particular this series on the business of literary translation. The Pan America Translation Committee advocates on behalf of literary translators working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. Just a couple of things. The winners of Penn's Translation Awards were recently announced. The awards will be presented at a ceremony on April 11th, along with Penn's other literary awards. These are listed on the website, penn.org slash translation, where you can also find the only model contract for literary translation in this country, along with FAQs about the business of literary translation and the publishing process. And we urge translators and publishers to look at them. If you're interested in joining Penn and the Translation Committee, a link is also included here on our page. Translators who publish one book are eligible to join the recently formed subcommittees to engage with publishers on important issues in literary translation, as well as another one for protecting freedom of expression for translators, which is in keeping with Penn's mission for writers. Penn World Voices Festival is coming up next month. Uh, the Translation Committee is sponsoring a record number of events, one on April 28th on translating activism, and then on April 29th, the always popular translation slam. And on April 30th, we have another panel on translating nonfiction, which is followed by a tribute to the legendary translator, Edith Rosen. Details about all these events can be found on the festival's website, worldvoices.pen.org. Tonight is the second event in our spring series on the business of literary translation. The past 10 years have seen a tremendous amount of change in the field of literary translation, from the establishment of new presses and magazines focused on translation, to the push for greater visibility and better conditions for translators, to the growth of academic programs, residencies, and other opportunities for translators to enter the field and to enable them to work. With this series, which the Center for Fiction so kindly agreed to host, we want to take the measure of where things are in 2016. We aim for the series to be documentary in nature. We hope that you, the audience, and the participants will consider the system in full with all of its pluses and minuses as it is right now. It's also about defining and shaping direction for the future. Last month we heard from translators in various stages of their careers about breaking into the business of literary translation. And tonight we will hear from experienced and accomplished editors who are very much engaged in the business of literary translation. Without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Sal Robinson, who, with Bill Martin, founded the Bridge Series, and now runs it with Monica Zaleska. Sal herself has edited many wonderful works of literary translation, and is our mediator for this evening. I think we're just going to get started, so just so you know, we're going to have a discussion, and then there'll be some time for Q&A afterwards, so get your questions ready. Um, and this, this event will focus um, primarily on um, not on acquisitions or promotion or sort of the larger editorial role, but um, really line editing, structural editing, uh, sentence editing, and some of the nitty gritty. Uh, but before we get into that, I wondered if you could each tell us um, a little bit about how you got started in the field, uh, what your first translation was, or the first translation that you edited, and maybe Declan, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I started working at New Directions in 1990. And um, I was going to graduate school at NYU and answering phones at the front desk and um, uh, typing permissions agreements. And um, I sort of stuck around and ended up becoming an editor there. And um, I really was uh, saw the people around me who were senior there editing books and working with authors. And that seemed just thrilling to me. So I started. Um, working on um, some of the reprints um, and um, learning editing translation. And I was a little um, confused because it seemed like this great art, but um, I didn't really know um, how to do it. And um, editors from Norton, like Carol Hope Smith, I'd ask her, you know, she would say, well, you can't really learn editing, you just have to do it. Um, and um, I took an editing course with uh, Bina Kamlani at NYU, and um, she basically told us how to write letters to authors, um, 
saying uh, you can stick with your changes and um, you, know, you don't have to uh, agree with everything I say. But I didn't find that really helpful. Um, I mean, it was extremely helpful and actually the base of, of editing a lot, to a large degree. But um, the actual line editing was still sort of a mystery to me. And, um, and then I started to work on some books by Ann Carson and Guy Davenport that James Laughlin had brought into New Directions. And that didn't involve too much line editing. It was more seeing it through production. Um, but I really wanted to edit and learn how to edit. And um, uh, Barbara Epler was the editor-in-chief at the time. And um, she was editing uh, some stories by the Russian writer Victor Pelevin. And um, she gave me uh, one of the stories uh, um, an unedited version, and then a version that she had edited, marked up. So I uh, basically, you know, practiced editing the unedited version, and then would compare it to what she did. And um, sort of slowly showing work to Barbara, I kind of started to get the feel and the hang of what what it was. And I guess one of the first books I worked on was a short little um, book we published by the um, the writer Peter Hanka. And it was a little sort of short 90-page book um, of sort of 19 micro epics describing um, little um, encounters with nature. And it was an interesting book to, um, to have as your first editing project. And Tess Lewis was the um, translator. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, that was sort of interesting because it really wasn't a traditional novel by any stretch. It was these little sort of almost prose poems. One would just describe ice melting in a, in a, in a stream um, in minute detail. Um, so editing that involved just um, carefully um, reading it over and over again, hearing the voice, um, which is so important with Hanka. And um, the minutia was so intense, you really had to um, get inside it and sort of see how the prose worked out. And uh, that was a big learning experience and Tess was great to work with and I probably, I didn't totally feel like I knew what I was doing, but I learned a lot working on that book. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Cool. Jerry? Um, I started at Delphi Archive 2004-2005, I think. Um, just very boringly by answering uh, an ad, a want ad. Um, and I was hired as an editorial assistant, which I thought was going to be a lot of answering phones and uh, dealing with correspondence and just sort of, you know, very small things. But immediately I was handed like a 500-page Estonian novel <laughs> uh, to translate. And, uh, and so that's how I learned to do it, was with, I mean, actually it might be a 450-page Estonian novel. Um, but that's more or less how I, how I had to do it. Um, the founder and editor-in-chief, John O'Brien, had already gone through it once, and he said it wasn't really right yet, do something about it. Um, and so I tried to do something about it. And uh, after I got through with it, um, I was told that I'd done an okay job. Uh, and then it came back in galleys, and somewhere along the line, I was handed the galley to proofread as well. And John just said, sort of in passing, you know, I really would have gone a lot farther with that. So I took the galley and wrote <laughs> like over every line, like, oh no, I have to do this better, I have to do this better, and every single line. And when I handed in production, who was you know, just one person in a room, most things are bulkier, one person in a room, and production person sort of looked up at me and said, no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're not doing that. Um, so to this day, the, the 500 page Sonia novel weighs on me. <laughs> that, you know, all the things I could have done. But it's a really great book. It's called Things in the Night by Maddie Oot. And it's really good. I don't know if anyone read it. I hope that wasn't my fault. <laughs> and it's a very, very difficult book. I mean, and it, it does, it runs a range of things. Because um, the, the author was a, a newspaper columnist as well as a playwright, as well as a novelist. Um, in Estonia, they call him the inventor of the blog. I'm sure every country has like 17 inventors of the blog because he used to write daily columns just about, I woke up this morning at 3 o'clock, I made a cup of coffee, that sort of thing. And the book contains a lot of these little things. And so it went from a very conversational register to a really sort of epic poetic register. And I was totally at sea, and obviously Estonian is not a language anyone can double check who does not speak Estonian. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like French or Spanish where you can just sort of find your way about no matter what your you know, fluency level, assuming you have 
some basis. Um, it's basically from Mars, Estonia, um, yeah. like Finla Finnish. Um, and uh, so it was really just sort of me and the translator and just sort of getting along. And I guess it worked out OK. okay. Um, but yeah, that's, that was the first story. And, it, that was, and I immediately had to go on to another one. So. <laughs> and who was the translator on that? Uh, Eric Dickens. Okay. Eric Dickens. There aren't actually that many Estonian translators. We need more of them. So there isn't it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And Lexi? Um, I got into publishing a little bit backwards and sideways. Started part time um, after I graduated from college working for the New York Review of Books, and then that turned into full time. And then I ended up, I went to, um, at that point in time, they owned and published um, Granta Books, Granta Magazine. And I ended up going to work for them in London briefly um, for, for a couple years. And I had, at that point in time, I was doing, um, they had a sister company called The Little Book Room that did these kind of anecdotal travel guides, and so I was doing this travel guide on London. I had a lot of downtime because I had a kind of feast or famine. I was really busy or not busy at all. Um, and so I, I offered up my French reading services that have since since waned, and my French skills are a little bit less stellar than they used to be. So I was reading in translation a lot. And then um, then I ended up coming back to the US and working for Grant Books here when they had a sort of short-lived publishing program. And so I worked with an editor who was based in London, a German novelist whose name was Yuri Zay, um, on one of her books. And so that was actually a really great experience. We weren't physically in the same place, but we worked on this translation together and we could kind of go back and forth. And so that gave me a little bit of a sense of how one might do this editorially, even though I wasn't doing it on my own. And then um, when I came to Vintage, about a year after I got there, I was handed this really big manuscript. Um, and we had, when I arrived, just published Natsuo Karina's book out. Um, and I was interested in Japanese literature and studied Japanese literature when I was in college. Um, and I said, try this and see what you think. So I kind of descended into this dark, amazing, bleak world um, of what I like to refer to as feminist noir. And it was this story of these just a really demented relationship between a couple women. And I remember dreaming about one of these characters in particular. I can still tell you exactly what she looked like. She wore this trench coat. She was really skinny. She wore this terrifying blue eyeshadow. And I was having these nightmares about her as I was working on this book, painstakingly going over line after line. Um, so that was the first translation that I worked on, wow. um, which was immersive, but also really exciting. Uh -huh. And, and it continues to haunt you. And it clearly <laughs> continues to haunt you. I still remember what this character was wearing. This book that I ended in 2000. Uh, that's fantastic. That's really great. Um, yeah, so I think one of, uh, one of the kind of things that you wrestle with when you're editing translations is this question of your sense of English, standard English, and what the translation is doing, um, and that gets talked about or experienced in different ways. There's, this, there's the idea of translationese, where, um, uh, which is vague, but like uh, something that sounds wrong to an English ear. Um, and, uh, and I wondered if we could sort of dive into that um, specifically, like do you, when you encounter something in a book that sounds, in a translation that sounds wrong to you, do you, uh, do you take a step back and think, okay, well, maybe what sounds wrong to me is necessary here? Or, um, I mean, it sounds like a loaded question, right? Because if on the other side, if you're like, no, ah, there shall be no words with double letters in this book. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious about your experience with that and with like the phenomena of translation needs and uh, how you deal with that. Um, and whoever, this is a big question, so whoever is ready to go for it should just jump in. Um, I've always thought about it like a piece of music. Mm. Um, like you listen to a piece of music and you can tell if something, if something is off key, um, it doesn't sound right when you're listening and you may not know exactly why it doesn't sound right, but mm. it doesn't. And so when I read something and it sounds off key to me, that's when I usually take a step back and why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Is it there for a reason? Is it atonal? Um, because the writer wants it to be, or actually, do we need to fix this? That's sort of my way in. And do you then query the translator? Um, usually, I, I mark it and keep going. It's uh -huh. not something that I would sort of go to a translator with right away. Uh -huh. um, but usually, it's a collection. You know, right. You're trying to figure out, is this a 
pattern. Right. Um, and this is something, again, that's being done for a reason because it's probably reflective of something that's in the original, or is this actually a translator who isn't doing something that I want that right. I should be doing stuff on? I have to just, you know, note things and make my own lists. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, translation needs is usually in translations that, um, I mean, it pops up in every translation a little bit, but um, it, it's prevalent in translations that aren't as strong as, as other ones. And I think we're all fortunate to work at publishers that hire the best translators and mm -hmm. um, really get exceptional uh, work. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when you're mm -hmm. editing, you're trying to, you know, you can identify those translationese phrases and um, you know, clumsy, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of bad English. Um, but um, you, a lot, we're very, I mean, at least in New Directions, we're really lucky to work with translators like Susan Bernofsky and Margaret Schulkosta and um, Susanna Mead and all these great translators, and you get the work and. Um, you know, they, it needs line editing, and we can talk about um, what's involved with that. But mm -hmm. um, translation ease is, um, luckily, with a lot of our translators, not something that you have to hack away at and mm -hmm. change. You know, change from a clunky, wooden, um, sort of awkward mm -hmm. thing into some literary mm -hmm. poetic. Right. You know. It comes in at a different right. level. It's yeah. Yeah. But you do have to be careful because. If you try and sort of make it roll off the tongue and sound like standard English too much, sometimes you can be missing the style and the um, author's intent. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm, right. One of the first books I worked on was this um, Polish writer, Gustav Herling, and um, he's a magnificent 20th century Polish writer who escaped the Soviet gulag and ended up in Italy, and he wrote these magnificent stories. And I was working on the translations with Bill Johnston, mm -hmm. and um, the manuscript came in, and I caught wind that the Paris Review really wanted to run one of the stories, and um, they really wanted to see um, a, um, an, a, a version um, quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought I'd send them an edited version and quickly edit it without reading the whole manuscript and sent it to Bill, and Bill was like, you know, you're really not getting the, you know, he writes in a very non-colloquial, sort of, um, almost sort of awkward mm -hmm. style. Okay. And um, and I, that was a big lesson for me, that you really have to read through a whole text before you even think about you know, serious mm -hmm. um, changes. So you really, like, you know, you know what Lexi was saying, you, you sort of um, have to enter into it before you, know, you can mm -hmm. um, comfortably uh, suggest changes. Right, you need that like, yeah. greater context for the yeah. whole. Yeah, and Jeremy, do you have? Um, well, certainly translation translationes exists. I mean, and walks among us. Um, I don't know. I mean, the after many years of doing this, I've sort of come up with multiple explanations for for what the difference is between an editor coming in and sort of hacking and slashing about mm -hmm. and and having his or her way with the manuscript where you sort of throw out the, the sort of translator's intent and the author's intent in order to reach a sort of standard English and the mm -hmm. alternate version of that where the editor is very, very hands off and mm -hmm. leaves things even though they sound wrong mm -hmm. to him or her because they are too concerned about the, the author's intent and the translator's intent. And I sort of come down, and you can tell me how it sounds, <laughs> with the, the idea of um, control on the part of the author. Mm -hmm. So very boring example. Um, because it's it's kind of obvious and well known to everyone, but like the end of Ulysses, the stylistic, um, you know, the the outre way that it's written. The yes, I said yes, I will. Yes, now you can see someone coming at that if it's translated into Bulgarian or Estonian and saying, well, you can't write like that. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's totally wrong. You mm -hmm. know, from our perspective, and we have that we're on absolutely solid ground there. But in English, um, even though it is violating all sorts of rules, we understand that there's a real sense of authorial control there. This is all being done intentionally. This is all being done for a reason. There's an aesthetic purpose to this mm -hmm. decision. Um, and so what I look at when I'm looking at translation ease, and at my best, and when I'm, you know, and everything is working, and there's a real synergy between me and the translator, the idea is to sort of rescue that sense of control that the author had in the original language, even if that means actually changing what the particular things, the particles in the sentence, 
Um, so if it's meant to sound wrong, it still sounds wrong, mm -hmm. but it sounds wrong in the way that English sounds wrong mm -hmm. or is able to sound wrong. So you don't make it sound right because that's not what the book is doing. Right. But you do remove the sense that the translation may have gone off the rails there. Because something that readers have to deal with when they're reading translations, I don't know if it's often enough spoken about, is that no matter how sophisticated a reader you are, when you read a novel in translation, you know it's in translation. You know you're not reading English. And so if something peculiar happens in a sentence, you default to, oh, something went wrong with the translation there. Mm -hmm. You don't go, well, I trust the author. So the author is doing what they, they mm -hmm. want to do. Mm -hmm. right. You default to a sort of sense that something may have gone wrong. Right along the way. And, and that's what I want to avoid. Right, exactly. Reviews will talk about this and they don't know who to blame. They're trying to find the right target. You mm -hmm. know? And uh, that's sort of what I want to obviate, mm -hmm. I guess, from writing. So it's not that I want something to sound standard, but if it sounds unstandard, it needs to sound unstandard in a way that is available to English, right. which may be com very different from the ways that are available to Estonian or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Lexi, in, I mean, I know you have worked with a lot of Japanese projects. Has that been an issue, or is, do you notice sort of a difference in, um, is there like a greater gap, or are there other issues that come up? I don't know if it's necessarily any different from any other language. I've worked on translations from a bunch of different languages, and I'm not sure if from Japanese there's any separate set of issues. I mean, I think each language there's sort of and I don't speak Japanese so I can't speak to what's in the original but I sometimes find defaults you know too often um, things are referred to as like cute for example sometimes I'll come up and I'll think alright well is this something that's in the original or is this something that is just a sort of default and actually there's a word that I'm not understanding it's another mm -hmm. way this can be put um, but I don't know if I can come up with an example for you that's sort of specific to how it would be sure. um, in, in Japanese yeah. Great. Um, so, yeah, some specific questions on sort of those topics, but um, a little bit more focused. Um, so, have you have you ever made a change in a title or a character name? Has that been something that's come up? And what was the sort of uh, process that uh, was behind that? Tried to change character name. Like, oh, I think really I <laughs> <laughs> and why? I, you know, it was the the word was it was it was something along the line of, of crippled or damaged. Mm -hmm. It was a nickname for the character, and so they were constantly saying, "Hey, damaged, come over here," or "Hey, hey, crippled, mm -hmm. come over here," and and this just rubbed me the wrong way consistently. And there was maybe one page on page 365 where it was absolutely necessary that it be there. Uh -huh. um, and But for the rest of the book, I just sat there, sat there just sort of wringing my hands uh -huh. over this. Um, so in the end, I gave up on that one. Uh -huh. I, I'm not actually, it's not, it was, it's not neither damaged nor critical, but it was something very, very close to that. Sure, sure. And that, that bothered me. I'm sure there have been other occasions. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are these sort of there are these kind of, mm, I don't know how you're describing, like a title or a character name can be, well, first of all, they're repeated often, yes. right? Um, a character name, and uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a place where sometimes like the original language is maintained in a translation in some respect. Um, certainly with a title, I mean, there's the whole sense of like, you know, a new market, like for instance, I, I ended up with a, I acquired a book where the title turned out to be the exact title of an American novel that had been published five years before. So in that case, we decided, okay, we, there'd just be too much competition on Amazon. We have to come up with a new title for that. Um, and I think that was the right decision, but it was certainly, a, it was a change. It was a, a new change for a new sort of incarnation of the book. Um, yeah, I don't know, Declan, have you ever changed something something like that? Or? Um, I was gonna say, if, it was, if the first book was successful, maybe you should have kept the Right, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think it was, I don't think it was. <laughs> We're about to um, reissue Helen DeWitt's The Last Samurai. This is a brilliant novel. 
And that novel came out the same time as the Tom Cruise movie. Oh, and, I mean, it's a brilliant novel, and it sold a thousand copies because the novel's great, but it sold quite a few extra thousand copies. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't take the opportunity to do a tie-in edition? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> but um, right now I'm editing a book of stories, and um, I'm trying to figure out how to solve this problem because um, one of the characters has a nickname. He's, he refers to everything as cool. And so um, the narrator starts calling him cool. Like, that is his name. Mm -hmm. And it's his cousin. And it just doesn't sound good mm -hmm. when you're throughout the whole story. Um, and I can't, at first I thought, okay, well, he could be called cool and then just use his and he and use a pronoun. Mm -hmm. That wasn't really working. I thought Mr. Cool, but then I thought of all those books, you know, Mr. Happy, and Mr. Yes. That wasn't working. Out. And then Cousin Cool, because he's a cousin. And I, I still haven't figured it out. But Joe Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Coolio. Yeah. But as far as titles go, um, a big challenge sometimes when you're doing a collection of stories is that. Um, the, especially like an anthology of stories that have been come from different books, mm -hmm. you have to decide on the title. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, you're faced with two um, issues. One, you want to choose one of the strong stories um, to title the book, and you want to have a catchy title. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times with this book of stories, the Enrique Villamanta stories I'm working on, um, I just went down and, um, and sort of checked the catchy titles Reread the stories that I, of, of the ones I checked, picked the three or four strongest ones, um, Margaret Shul Costas translating. So I said, well, what do you think of these as titles? And then I went to Barbara and, and our publicity team, and we all settled on The Vampire in Love. So that's mm -hmm. the title of the book. Great. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we approve. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, along those lines, sort of in these like crucial or uh, words that might have like outsize effect in a book. Have you ever had to deal with non-PC language in a book? Um, and, and what was that like? How, what was that experience? Um, has that come up? I certainly have, I will just say. <laughs> um, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 another Enrique Villamontes one was um, this little short novella we did. Uh -huh. um, uh, it's a sort of this um, fantastical history of surrealist literature called The Brief History of Portable Literature. And, you know, all these um, famous surrealists are in there. Um, but he makes up surrealists also. And one of them is this Polish um, guy named Wata, Wata Boski or something. And he's wandering around Paris, followed by a black servant. Mm -hmm. And um, the and Philomatis is just having fun with this. And he's not, I don't think he's a racist writer. But there were um, moments where it was sort of offensive, mm -hmm. the way. Um, and I can't remember exactly um, what little tweaks I did, but I, I do remember um, making some little changes to sort of make it not quite as sort of um, horrible. Sure. And I'm sure Villamontes was part of part of what he was doing was um, being intentionally that way to poke fun at and it was part of the playfulness of the whole book, but it wasn't working. It was sort of it was offensive. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just tried to maybe tone it down a little. Right. I can't remember what changes I made, but I remember doing uh -huh. Uh -huh. Small. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we published a, a novel by a French writer whose name is Roman Puerto Las this past year, uh -huh. and that was a comedic novel. It's a farce, basically, uh -huh. about this man who comes from India who's determined uh, to get sure. this IKEA wardrobe. This is the IKEA. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. In any case, in French, I think certain things that were less inflammatory when rendered in English became very inflammatory, and we had that extra challenge that we were publishing it. Um, I was working with colleagues in the UK and mm -hmm. in Canada mm -hmm. and in Australia. Mm -hmm. It was this kind of big random house project. Um, and so we were trying to publish in English for all these different English language sure. markets and keep things sort of appropriate in their slang because there was a lot of slang. 
and have it not be offensive. Um, and so that was challenging. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was not the primary editor on this book. It was a British editor. And then we were just kind of stepping in and pointing out things that were working or not working. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we did make changes so that things that um, maybe, even if they were inflammatory in French, but taken as a joke mm -hmm. when rendered in English for our audience, we felt that it wouldn't be taken that way, that it would be taken at face value. And so we made changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That sounds extremely difficult. Marsh language <laughs> was different English. <laughs> Because uh, even, I think even within them, there are things that sound sort of more offensive yes. or more provocative. Um, yeah. Yeah, Jeremy, if you have... Oh boy, all the time. Oh, uh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how familiar people are here with Balky Archive's list, but the uh, one of the things that Balky Archive attempts to do is to publish subversive literature, literature that might be a little too off-putting or experimental or difficult uh, for other presses to publish and sort of give them a home and keep them in print and all that's very laudable. Um, but there have been books, well, okay, I can think of things on either side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. There is a book, I've, I'd be very surprised if anyone in this room has read it, called Assisted Living by a Swedish author named Nikanor Terrat Logan, mm -hmm. um, which is a pseudonym. And it is very close to being the most vile and disgusting thing I've, I've ever read, let alone <laughs> edited <laughs> uh, in my life. Um, to, to give you a very, a very small glimpse into what was so concerned about it, I never want to do that much research into Holocaust deniers ever again <laughs> for the rest of my life. And that's actually pretty tame for this book. I mean, I'm talking necrophilia, cannibalism. I'm talking like it makes American Psycho look like really just a walk in the park. Um, and in that case, because that was the whole point of the book, I touched nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. as vile as he was, I just held my tongue because that would be like censoring Desaad, because that was his entire point, to mm -hmm. be sure. a contemporary Desaad, to be as upsetting to someone now. Like, what is the most upsetting thing in the, what, for, for people in a, you know, civilized so-called Western society would be mm -hmm. Holocaust deniers. Okay, mm -hmm. well, let's load them up, you mm -hmm. know, what would be upsetting? Right. Like, this is, that was the whole point of the book. Right. Um, it was supposed to be, you know, sinister literature, you know, in the, in, in the most extreme way. Mm -hmm. um, and I will never read it again. It's actually a fascinating book. Like, I'm not saying it's a bad book. I'm glad we published it. I'm mm -hmm. glad I had something to do with it. But, um, you know, I keep it in the light box, that right. sort of thing. <laughs> On the other side, there was a very memoir-esque kind of auto-fictional book by a Swiss-German writer, who I won't name, that came out a few years ago. And it was a book about his time in Paris. And um, charming book, you know, a little ahead of its time in terms of the sort of auto-fictional thing. I mm -hmm. mean, he, he was sort of hanging out there. Some that Thomas Bernhardt even actually thought was actually a pretty good writer. So I mean, he said that about what four people in like his mm -hmm. entire life. So you know, hey, this must mean something. And there was a part of the book, and it, it w I would say that he was a kind of chauvinistic, macho kind of bastard mm -hmm. of a writer, like living that kind of life in the late seventies. And that's what the book was about. And that was, you know, you can't remove that because mm -hmm. you have no book. And he's very self-critical, so mm -hmm. it was you know, very much in that line of, oh, I'm a terrible person, but you should read about me because I'm so fascinating, that right. sort of thing. Um, but there was a chapter in the book where he just very outright, very casually turned into a racist. It came out of absolutely nowhere. Mm -hmm. And it was totally unexamined racism. It wasn't that there was a point to it. It wasn't that it served a function in the story. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that he got his comeuppance later about it. There, it certain, there was zero aesthetic purpose for it. It was just... He was copying his diaries, and he happened to be the sort of person that thought these things in 1976. You know, hopefully, mm -hmm. with the benefit of hindsight, he's come out of that phase in his life. And I really didn't know what to do about it. He only speaks German. I couldn't speak German. Mm -hmm. I mean, his daughter, we had to go through his daughter. He doesn't use email. You know, the whole... Mm -hmm. That's what editing is like, is trying to find strange connections to people who refuse to answer the phone. Um, <laughs> and, and, that's true, right? Yes. <laughs> and... and he finally wrote back to me, I mean, this, you know, it took who knows how long, and I was sweating bullets because of deadlines, and I, I just said, we can't publish this like this, we have to take this out. Uh -huh. And I, I mean really take it out, like I took like 300 words out, like they're just mm -hmm. gone, you know, and I, you know, I, I don't like making invisible changes in books, mm -hmm. but they're, they're just gone. And he wrote me back and he said, you know, sure, of course, I don't mind. You know, I was so worried, but he, he, was, he was happy to be rescued, he hadn't looked at the book in, mm -hmm. in 20 years. Yeah. You know, um, he actually, he, he was he was surprised that he even cut other things too, you know, so it made me start wondering what else I should have <laughs> <laughs> um, So, so that, you know, it worked out really well in uh -huh. that case. So, yeah. it, it depends again, what does the book want, I right. guess? Does it right. want to be offensive? Does it, you know? Right, right. where so. is it sort of, yeah. Right. 
Well, that's a lovely segue into my next question, which is um, more on the level of line editing. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I'd love to talk about line editing and also specifically have you cut passages or sentences and how did that process work? So did you uh, contact the translator? Did the translator then contact the author or was it solely done with the translator? Um, and I'm sure this has happened various times. So anything that comes to mind? Um, interesting example that I have, and actually is this first book that I mentioned earlier, Grotesque. Um, we changed the ending. Mm -hmm. um, we felt that the ending, um, when you read it in English, it felt completely realistic. There was nothing fantastical about it, and it was supposed to read as something fantastical, something was supposed to happen, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't meant to be taken literally at all. And so um, we went directly to the author via an assistant who worked with her who spoke English and explained the issue and came up with a way using her words and um, sort of knitting some things together, so not adding anything, but just slightly <coughs> revising her text to get the fantastical sense um, that the original ending was supposed to evoke, and we worked with her on it. Um, and um, we were all happy with it, the author was happy with it. Um, even now, if you look on Amazon, you find people saying, but I read the original in Japanese and you changed it and it's not the same. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And that's completely true. Mm -hmm. But it was an ending that everybody liked mm -hmm. um, and was happy with and felt did the book a service in English. Sure. Yeah. I mean, every once in a while we'll, um, I mean, when you're edit, when you're line editing, um, you do come across paragraphs where um, you know a, a sentence is redundant within the paragraph, mm -hmm. and so you'll um, might recommend deleting the whole sentence altogether. Um, and you know you always send your changes to the translator, and um, that doesn't necessarily need the approval of the author. Mm -hmm. you know? But we have had instances where. Um, you know, I was working on a book by uh, um, this Brazilian writer, um, Luis, Luis Fernando Verissimo, and it's a book about Borges um, at a at a at a Edgar Allan Poe conference. Mm -hmm. And um, I sent the book to um, Donald Yates, the translator of Labyrinth, thinking he'd enjoy it. And he wrote me back this horrified letter. Borges would net. That he, he was worried about, I forget exactly what it was, but it's something at the end that Borges did and, and a few um, pages where he found some, something completely un Borges like. So, um, so Margaret Jewel Costa was the translator of, of that book too, and so I sent her Don Yates' um, work concerns and uh, I said, should we ask Verissimo what he thinks? And she said, well, it is just a novel. But um, <laughs> she, I said, well, um, then she finally agreed to send it to Verissimo, and he, he was actually pretty outraged that we mm -hmm. didn't um, just go with the flow of the, of the book. And he said, this is a fiction, and who cares? And mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. how that ended up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I think in every case there's a different sort of set of participants, different author, different translator, different circumstance. So that's fantastic. He was just like, go for it. Uh, that's great. Um, so uh, yeah, I had a question about working with multiple translators at once, either like two translators on one book, two translators on one author. Um, is this something you've experienced? What has that been like? Um, I know we talked at a certain point about, who was it? Not Agualusa, but um, ah, it'll come to me later. <laughs> um, but yeah, have you, have you worked on projects that have had two translators? For sure, uh, yeah, I, I think it's great, okay. usually. Um, I think it's especially great when it takes the kind of um, David Mamet, uh, Chekhov approach almost, where you have a native speaker who works intimately with an English speaker who is hopefully a good writer. And I find that then they produce kind of synthesis. Because um, editing that usually tends to be much easier because they've already essentially edited it um, for you. So I tend to find that that's, that's great. Oh, I mean, they're- like the Peter Volokonsky. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, where you have someone involved who is actually really an editor. 
uh -huh. already. I mean, that's one way of doing it, and I think that's wonderful because there's already so many checks and balances in place. Um, because editing is really a dialectic. I mean, well, at least uh, in my when I do it with the translator, I mean, very rarely with the author. Sometimes with the author, but mm -hmm. you know, I come in with my my barnstorming. Well, that that doesn't look right at all to me. I'm going to suggest an alternative, and they're supposed to be the one to say yes to this, no to that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and sort of and so. If that exists already within the relationship, the working relationship, the translator, then that's fantastic. Um, and then usually you're speaking to someone who isn't so married to the original text; they can see that the context may have changed for this this you know particular effect, and so therefore it needs to be reworded. Uh, but there have been, I mean, there there that's my preferred mode. <laughs> um, it just makes my life easier. Um, but there are obviously there are also collaborative translators where they're really just both working on the text together um, mm -hmm. equally, as opposed to repeating sort of a three step. Um, process and that can get that can get muddy, but not many, not much more muddy <laughs> than a single translator mm -hmm. necessarily. Um. Yeah, I did. Um, I edited *Her Humor Comes* one, two, eight, four, and we had two translators on that book, really because it's a long book and it was published in Japan over a longer period of time, and then we wanted to do it all at once. It's one story, um, and so. There was one translator who had done the first two books, and then another translator who came in while the one was still finishing the second book to do the third book so we could have it ready at the same time. Um, and so that was just more a question of refereeing and how do you, you know, if one person is describing the car as gray and another person is describing a car as silver, just making sure that you were noting all these things throughout. If one, per if one character in the first two books is always going out on his balcony and in the third book he's going out on his veranda, you know, just making sure you had a kind of running list of these tiny terms as you went through everything. And my biggest fear was that it would somehow sound different, that you would have a book that, you know, two-thirds of the way through would suddenly sound like a different writer, because it is in the hands of a different translator. Um, but that was not problem. <laughs> it all worked out. And fortunately, I think in that book, it takes a very strange turn about um, as you enter the third book, it, it goes in a direction where it, it feels different because it was written at a slightly later point in time. So it actually worked very well to have another translator come in and be able to render it um, in, in his own words. And I think the most relieved I've ever felt when reading reviews was seeing reviews saying, and you wouldn't even know it was two translators. It sounded seamless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just signed a... Um, a couple of books by a Swedish writer, and the translators are Steve Murray and Tina Nunnally, mm -hmm. and they're a husband and wife team, and um, uh, one of the books um, were the originating publisher, and the other, um, uh, Harville Secker in the mm -hmm. UK is, and they've hired Tina to translate one of the books, and Steve edits her translation, and he's translating our book, and she edits it. Oh, so, wow. that's... Yeah. That's cool. And they they're very, they've been very successful okay. Um, okay. translating from the Swedish doing that. Uh -huh. so. um, yeah, I mean this this hadn't even occurred to me earlier, but the question of working with another editor as well, like yeah. a, um, a foreign editor that Lexi brought up, um, uh, is a whole other aspect that's t I think tends to happen fairly often in translation because the UK publishes a lot of translations as well, so. Do you have you tended to work with the same editor over time? Like you're always working with so and so at Harvell Secker or, or um, Penguin or something. Yeah. 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 I've worked. Um, I do a lot of work with Harvell Secker as well, and so I have my people who I tend to work with. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. Easy, happy, generally relationship, and usually, you know, it's not two people doing all that right. sort of work. It's right. one person does most of it, and then you send it to a second person. That person will give it a read and make suggestions. So right. To the lead editor and not, and yeah. yeah, that works. That has always worked well for you. Yeah. Have two people kind of doing a full-on line editing would be that'd be crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, fantastic. Um, and so I think I'm just going to ask one more question, and then we can open it up. Um, this is more of an acquisitions-focused question, and um, it has to do with the discussions about um, equity and diversity in publishing that are uh, prevalent these days. Do you, when you're looking for books, do you feel a certain urgency to find authors and maybe even translators um, who are working in languages that aren't published very often, who are writers of color, um, LGBTQ writers? Is that part of your thinking at all? And 
and yeah, go for it. <laughs> for sure. I mean, I'm, I'm not doing it anymore at the moment, but it's uh, at the LP Archive, for instance, we had an enormous uh, map of Africa over our conference table as a sort of form of self-flagellation because we published oh. almost nothing oh, wow. from the continent. And Dalkey's, Dalkey's mission is to cover the world and we've uh -huh. been pretty bad. We had like one Algerian novel, uh -huh. you know, um, and that still hasn't been fixed. So that was, uh, that, that was, that was pressure uh -huh. 10 years ago. That was, it's always been a pressure yeah. um, there. I mean, you'd have to be kind of monstrous not to be <laughs> a little bit of uh, something you're thinking, especially when at Dalkey explicitly, you, you know, you want, you want your list to at least include every single every language and every continent, at least in theory. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a serious pressure. It's very hard, though, mm -hmm. I, I have to say. I mean, I edited Best European Fiction for a few years mm -hmm. when it was coming out, and <coughs> no matter what I did, I'd end up like do I doing the percentages at the end of the day and just sort of shaking my head and like, you know, mm -hmm. thinking like we've, we failed. Someone's going to like show, show us up for the, you know, the pigs that we are, and I mm -hmm. can't believe that we've ended up with this, these, you know, and I did, I did what I could. You mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, but it's so, yeah, so it weighs. Ways. <laughs> yeah, I died in guys. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've published in English as well as in translation, so like, but it's, I have a, a slightly broader canvas because I'm pulling from both English and translated works. And I agree, it's a challenge because it's, um, it's a question of how you find things, right? I mean, from from the languages that are more commonly translated, there are more agents, there are more translators, there are people that the question of discoverability is an easier one because there's more coming at you, there's more things that are being written about. Um, so I, I'm never inclined to publish something just because it's from a language that I haven't published before, just because it's telling a story um, that feels like um, it, it should be published. I think it has to be a work that is up to a certain set of standards and then you want to publish it. I think we're certainly always open to publishing a really widely diverse group of writers, but it, it's got to be something that feels right for what we do. Mm -hmm. yep. <coughs> I would say that New Directions is, has the sort of um, history of publishing a lot of you know white European... Um, I mean, James Lachlan was... Um, traveled all over the world and was very interested in bringing writers from um, many languages into, uh, into English. Um, but, uh, you know, like Lexi was saying, you know, most important to us is publishing writers who are experimental and, um, you know, really doing something new and, um, you know, of the highest literary quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, um, you know, especially recently, we've really been feeling a strong need to bring out more Arabic writing. Mm -hmm. So we've been publishing um, this writer, Jaber from Lebanon, mm -hmm. he's really interesting, and um, a writer named Kalito from Morocco. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, we've, we've, we're, we're very, we're keeping a close eye on. There are a lot of really interesting small um, presses in France and um, you know, throughout the Arab world, we just published two novels by an Egyptian writer, Sanala Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. um, I saw them on the shelves of McNally yeah. Jackson yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. Good. Excellent. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Fantastic. Um, so now we're going to open it up to questions. Um, and I don't think there's a microphone. I think you just need to stand up, be loud. Um, yeah. So, it's been to hear. The way that you work with the translators was it just kind of came easy about the specific relationship with translators themselves. And what has contributed to the strongest relationships we've had with individual translators is that they just really friendly, but because they give you a lot of information outside of the book or Essentially, what makes a really good relationship with the translator happen? Sure, yeah, what makes a good relationship? I can say, I mean, just for my, it's great when they give you lots of other information outside of the book. It's great if they pre present you with a really holistic picture of the reception of the book and where it came from, but that's not really necessary. It's, I, I, think, I think it's fantastic, I encourage it. But, uh, I don't know. I mean, it really seems like the, the, for me, the split has always been between the translators who are patient with you, because you can't read the original language nine times out of ten, um, 
And so when you suggest something, they don't hit the ceiling. They look at it in the spirit of collaboration and say, well, like I just sort of said a few minutes ago, yes to this, no to this, here's why, that sort of thing. And that's what's really great, I think, in, when I really appreciated translators in the past, um, is that they, they understand you're sort of coming at it as a sympathetic first reader, um, as an editor. Um, that you're not, I hope, trying to you know, come in with a hatchet and, and do damage to their work. But actually, the, the lesson that you learned about writing that letter saying these are only suggestions would have been very helpful to me early on. <laughs> because it took me a little while to work out that boilerplate of, please calm down, I'm not trying to rewrite the book. I, these are only suggestions. You're free to do with them what you like. You know, I may insist on one or two things at the end of the day, but you want to overrule me. Whatever your name goes on the cover, not mine. You know, <laughs> so um, so that to me is just collaboration. You know, just being an open, happy collaborator. You know, and not the, and there should be no no what's the word, no protectiveness um, on either person's part. Because that's not the editor's book. Um, and then, but then again, it's not really the translator's book. It's it's a little more of the translator's book than the editor's book. But where you're you're both trying to serve the integrity of the original in, in some way. So. Yeah. I was just wondering for those of you who understand other languages than English, when you are editing a book in that language that's coming from that language, do you take advantage of that and read the book in the original language, or do you just look at the translation? I generally only look at the translation and I go back to the original if I have a question. Um, because I have found it doesn't always help me to have read the original, and then if I when I do have a question, if it's about word choice or something, or a sentence that I just don't think is sounding right, then I'll go back and I'll look at the original and I'll look at the sentence construction or I'll look at the word and figure it out from there. Um, and that's both a blessing and a curse. I think when I don't have that luxury in another language, you just figure it out. Um, so sometimes I end up taking more time on something when actually I probably could have found my way there anyway. Um, that's how I do it. I did that. I mean, I. Um, the translator was supposed to be here this evening, but she couldn't come. I work um, with Sandra Smith on some translations um, of Erin Namarati's backlist, and so I do read print so I can go look things up and then ask Sandra a specific question. Um, but then, if it's another language, I don't have that option. Yep, in the back. Um, I was wondering about the comment and then a question. Um, the comment is that I'm struck by your, in, in many of your remarks about how much um, the work of an editor mirrors the work of the translator. Um, we um, also look for uh, that, that issue of the, the, the PC-ness of a text is something, I translate from German, and, um, and nearly every text I've translated um, has things that I, I call it massaging. <laughs> you know, evening out some of the stuff that uh, you know, would, would, would not really work for the new readership for all kinds of reasons. Um, another thing that didn't come up, but, but um, I feel as though there's a lot of self-editing on the translator's part is in punctuation. Uh, Germans have a great love of um, exclamation points. Mm -hmm. everywhere. <laughs> um, and just when I think I've um, omitted a sufficient number of them, let's say 75% of them, um, the editor will say, you know, we might want to take out some of these exclamation points that you have in your manuscript. Um, so I, I feel as though we're working hand in hand, sometimes unawares. Um, and, and the question that I had that was puzzling me um, is for almost all of my translations, um, they've not been read in-house. Um, the editor in-house will read it just to make a few comments, maybe a couple of uh, scribbles in the margin, but then outsource it to somebody who does a thorough job of, of addressing the issues that you've mentioned and the small things, um, you know, commas or whatever else. Um, issues large and small tend to happen, at least in my experience, out of house. Um, so is that, is that different in your, in your experience? I mean, at New Directions, we have you know, three or four editors who do all the editing. We don't outsource editing. Mm -hmm. We outsource proofreading and copy editing, and, mm -hmm. um, but, but not the editing. And for us too, um, we do the editing ourselves, we do outsource the copy editing, and so those questions of commas and the semicolons and so on are often 
query by a copy editor, um, if not by the editor in the first place, but the actual editorial work, the line by line editorial work is done in, in house. We'll all come around. Yes. Um, yeah, I just was wondering um, if there's a spectrum. Um, I've done a lot of, I'm a freelance writer and editor, and I've done a fair bit of editing of translated fiction for genre, a big, you know, genre publishing house. And it almost feels like I was, I kind of developed a bit of a distaste for it because I felt like that the book package I was doing with expected me to rewrite really just bad slasher novels, but it was almost as if the, you know, the kind of hands-off, it's like hands-off literary fiction, and then in genre fiction, it's like, just go at it, and it was just confusing to me, and I also had a second part to my question, is how one would, as a freelance editor, um, go about getting work in editing literary um, fiction or nonfiction, you know, because I've done literary fiction, but you know, which is more hands off. So, yeah. I don't. You should. You should just email it off the archive. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be handed an Estonian. <laughs> well, that's that's that is the danger. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would think. I can see. What she said about the out of house. I mean, I felt like there were a bunch of us that were these out of house you know, contractors mm -hmm. working for a large, you know, publishing house, and mm -hmm. there was very little contact with the in-house, the in-house editor just sort of managed the process. Sure, sure. Maybe you should ask the woman who stood up. Yeah. Yeah. The woman who stood up back there, it sounds yeah. like. Right? Seems like. Oh, ask uh, if I need an editor. <laughs> <laughs> if you can connect her with houses that hire freelance editors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I yeah. don't have any control over that process. I don't <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would, I mean, I think I have worked on stuff that was sort of vaguely genre fiction, but not really sort of like literary genre fiction, <coughs> literary crime. Uh, yeah. But I would guess that I, c I could see why the expectations were for a heavier editorial yeah. hand um, for those. Because uh, in those cases, I assume that the thought process is this thing is not supposed to be read necessarily as a kind of an expression of an original text that it's meant to be read as like a stay up all night slasher novel. Yeah, right. Um, so. I mean, they're not all that bad. I mean, some are very, yeah. very good, like Nordic you know, thrillers or something where sure. it's, you know, you didn't have to do as much. But. Yeah. Yeah, no, but it's a really interesting question. I think that's probably definitely with like the surge of Nordic crime fiction, that's a lot of editors are probably dealing with those types of issues. You've been so patient. <laughs> Please, go. I had two questions. One is, uh, I mean, like you mentioned that you speak French, but if any of you have translated yourselves, and what, whether that experience influences how you edit or the experience of being edited as a translator. And the other separate question is, it's very common for translators to do a sample translation for publishers. Less common, I think, is for editors to actually offer a sample edit to translators mm -hmm. because um, I know cases where that, that hasn't been a good match, where an editing style and you know some translators I know have not liked being very heavily edited or not being edited enough. Um, and how how the three of you um, respond to that, or whether you offer that when you start working with a new translator that you haven't worked with before, um, especially on a big project or something. I have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, you know, I've been, I've translated about 300 words of Pierre Klosowski's uh, La Vocation Sans Sondu. Uh, I come back to it every three or four years. <laughs> Change a word here and there. That's about as close as it's come. Um, I think that has actually helped me, as a matter of fact. Uh, you know, um, but uh, yeah, one of these days, maybe in like 50 years or so, I may get to like page 30. Um, in terms of sample edits, though, I, I think, I mean, I, people can contradict me, I think that's extremely unusual just because of the time frame. There's just, I mean, editors have things flying at them and they need to take care of them all the time. But um, I have actually done that because um, at the Archive there's a lot of educational programs. 
And so sometimes when you're training a translator um, coming through sort of the university program that you're attached to, um, I've occasionally done sample edits for translators, actually. I just do 10 pages just to show them what, they, what to expect, what's coming down the line. Um, but that's, that's really an exception, even, even there, because I had to just sort of rush it, because there's actually you know, another book that really is coming out that needs to be um, paid attention to. So I have done that, and I think it's helped a good deal. Um, as has coming up with a really great you know, cover letter saying, this is how the situation is going to plan out. Because that way the translator will understand, you know, where I'm coming from and, and you know what her responsibilities and what her you know um, options are. That she can tell me to go to hell if she really wants to, and I'll be, you know, sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've never. Um, I I don't translate, so I can't answer the first part of the question. Um, but I've never offered a, a sample edit before. I do think the key is just communication early on in advance. You know, you if you are looking at sample translations, or then you sign on to work with the translator, it's just being communicative as about what you know what I as an editor am looking for and also on behalf of the translator being communicative about the way you see the book going and obviously the editor will have seen the sample translation so it's clear that you know you, you agree what the book should be like but then keeping those lines of communication open I found you know, I've never I've never had a problem with the translator where the translator was very unhappy with the way the book went or what the process was like or the final product um, and I think that's for me, it's been all about just having an open dialogue all the way along. Yeah, we have time for just one more question. Okay, last question. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to say first, I'm really relieved to hear that other, you know, that you've had to address the issue of PC language because I translate children's books and I almost feel like I'm butchering the book because I have to make it. Uh, Correct. I mean, these are books that otherwise uh, can become very controversial. Um, but the question I have is, um, has to do with the possibilities and pitfalls of working with translators who are themselves authors of fiction. Wow. Jeremy, would you like to talk about that? <laughs> wow. <it? laughs> um, oh, boy. There are so many stories I do not want to tell you because they still keep me up at night. Um, <laughs> I mean, are you talking about authors who translate themselves? No, authors who are fiction writers, but then also work as translators. I see. Well, I mean, that's much more common in other countries, it seems to me. Like, it's in Germany, um, for instance, it seems like a, quite a few authors that I've, and in Israel, and in, in France too, to a certain extent, um, a, a lot of the writers that I've worked with and having their books translated to English um, have been really excellent English speakers, or at least English readers, because they've translated um, English language works into Hebrew or into French or into German. Um, and I, I, I don't find I mean, that actually seems to help the matters more than almost anything because they understand that it's they understand the translations about compromise. They have a belief in paraphrase. Paraphrase exists. <laughs> it is something that you can paraphrase, and I do that. You can paraphrase a work of art. Um, it may be a dilution, and it may be mutilation, even in the worst case, but it's still the work of art can remain in that. And so having an understanding of that, I think, is extremely useful for an author seeing their work translated. As for authors who translate themselves, um, that's usually a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some of the worst um, you know, mistakes I've ever made have been crossing a writer who translated themselves, you know, um, because they, they're really married to the English in a way that a professional translator in, in, from another language to English is not necessarily married. Uh, and, and those, I, I don't want to talk about that, it's just too depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I work with a, um, a Canadian writer who is also a French translator. He lives in Montreal. He's actually American by birth, but then he's, he's been Canadian for a long time. He's a Canadian citizen. And we published his novel um, this year, which is called Boo. And working with him has been, um, has been wonderful, actually, in part because he is a translator. And I think, number one, the editorial process was really interesting because he looks at things like both a writer and a translator. He's very, very, very careful about word choice. Um, and um, I imagine that he is also a wonderful translator. I mean, I think it's just made him very, um, very thoughtful about the whole dialogue back and forth. So for me, it was a, a, um, a benefit, um, not anything else. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up there. But thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, and there is wine in the back, which you should drink. Uh, and uh, please join me in thanking the panelists. Cool.